So this uh, presentation is um, is called Taking the Hippie Bus to the Enterprise. It's about uh, three problems that I have uh, experienced as a, in my life as a software developer. And I'm going to show uh, a solution that uh, I think is uh, pretty cool to these problems. <coughs> yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Mogens Heller Grabe, and uh, I'm a software developer at a pretty cool BI uh, consultancy and software development consultancy called uh, D60. And, uh, and I'm also a software developer at a company called Particular Software that uh, develops um, actually a competing product called End Service Bus. So it's kind of a, a finicky situation uh, for me. Uh, but um, but I'm I'm still allowed to uh, to work on a rebus and I'm still allowed to talk about it. So that's what I'm, well, that's what I'm going to do today. Uh, if you have any uh, questions or think of anything afterwards, please uh, write me an email or contact me on Twitter. Yes, this presentation will be about. Um, I will start out by talking about uh, what I think your problem is, uh, and by that I mean possibly. Uh, Actually, I'm, I may mean that that's my problem, uh, so I might be projecting here. But um, in my life as a software developer, I have uh, often uh, come across uh, these uh, three problems that I'm going to talk about, uh, and I've see seen them uh, solved in uh, many uh, uh, bad ways. Um, so I'm going to talk about how to, how to solve it in a, in a better way. So that's the part where I introduce my uh, Rebus project, which is a .NET uh, service bus. Uh, actually, I like to think of it just as a messaging library. Um, and then I'm going to show you some fairly concrete examples on how these problems can be solved. Yeah. And some wrap up afterwards. I will uh, start out with uh, some slides and some talking. Um, but uh, after uh, all this, uh, Talking on the architecture track, I think some uh, real live running code is in place. So I'm, I'm going to show you some code as well. I hope that's all right. All right. So what's your problem? I'm guessing that some of you might be struggling with systems that uh, are challenged because they have become big and uh, they will continue becoming bigger and bigger. Uh, it usually starts out like you have to build some, something uh, simple and then uh, your uh, customer or your employer wants uh, something extra and then you add it and you keep on adding stuff to the system and you end up with this huge uh, monolithic uh, pile of uh, spaghetti. So I think uh, this has uh, pretty much been a recurring theme on the track today. Uh, so I'm going to show you uh, one way to perhaps uh, attack this problem. Moreover, uh, I have seen um, many problems with integration with external parties. Um, I think it was Sam Newman who mentioned the illities. Uh, this uh, problem with integration with external parties, that's basically an availability problem, where the availability problems of those external parties are imposed on you. So if um, I've seen so many systems fail because some external party failed or wasn't there. So I'm going to show you a, a way to handle that. Moreover, I have seen uh, in many systems very complex logic that is sort of stuff happening that makes other stuff happen, that makes other stuff happen, and then maybe the system sort of waits for a while and then some other stuff happens again. And um, usually I have seen stuff like this implemented in a very uh, uh, implicit and fragmented way by possibly having a bool somewhere and an integer in another place and uh, together these things um, actually compose the state of some kind of process that is going on in the system. But it's, it's uh, fragmented and it's, um, it's implicit and spread all over the system. So I'm going to show you uh, a way to perhaps make this a little more concrete. Yeah, so to sum it up, you're struggling with a monolith, perhaps you have some integration problems, and you have perhaps problem coordinating your logic uh, or reasoning about which processes are going on in your system. Um, one solution, here I'm saying the solution, but I don't want to be so bold as to claim that this is the solution. Uh, I mean, maybe tomorrow we will figure out uh, a better way to handle these uh, things. 
But the best way that I know of at the moment to handle these things is by using messaging in uh, intelligent ways. Um, and if you're, if just so everyone is uh, clear on what I mean by messaging, I mean uh, when you want to perform some kind of operation, you can model that operation as a chunk of data that can be persisted somewhere and can be delivered to somewhere else. So basically, that's just that's messaging. That's just storing and representing operations as chunks of data that can be uh, exchanged and saved. <coughs> yeah. Um, but in order for all of this to work, um, this messaging has to happen by using uh, durable asynchronous queues. They have to be durable so that uh, when we send a message somewhere, we are guaranteed that this message is saved. So the message is uh, just as important at, as a piece of data that we might want to store in a database. Uh, so it's very important that these messages are treated with the same uh, with the same care as the data in our database. So therefore, we have to use durable message queues. Moreover, it has to be asynchronous. Uh, this way, uh, we have this uh, fire and forget way of sending messages, and this way we will uh, we will never block when sending a message. So we will never wait for some recipient to be there or anything like that. We can always count on being able to uh, deliver, to get our messages sent. So uh, whether they're actually delivered to the recipient, that's, uh, that's another story. And that's handled by the queues or whatever. Yes. And um, are there any .NET developers in here? <laughs> OK, cool. Um, if you're a .NET, .NET developer, chances are that you are uh, running your code on Windows, and uh, then you're in luck, because uh, Windows, since uh, Windows 2000, has had a built-in asynchronous durable message queue called MSFQ, Microsoft Message Queue, uh, that you can enable by putting a check mark in Add Remove Windows Components. Mm -hmm. So there actu ac actually is a queue that we can use uh, to do these uh, things built into Windows. So that's pretty cool. Yes, and now I'm going to talk about Rebus. Rebus is uh, is an enterprise service bus, but um, I think when when I say enterprise service bus or service bus, then people will be thinking in like they have people have experiences with service buses, and there's a lot of uh, <laughs> uh, commercial products out there that that are service buses. Um, but um, yeah, so to avoid, uh, I mean. To avoid confusion, um, I just want to tell you that Rebus is not a, a, a huge uh, broker thing or a huge monolithic uh, central thing that uh, can do everything in the world and um, and translate messages and uh, integrate with uh, all kinds of systems. It can't do anything like that. Rebus is actually just a messaging library. It's a very simple messaging library that can help you exchange messages in intelligent ways. So that's basically it. So it's a it's a thin layer on top of some kind of queues, and I'm going to show you today with the MSM queue underneath. Um, yeah. So that's basically it. Um, moreover, I'm I like to call it a, a hippie bus, <laughs> um, but that's uh, that's sort of to to counter this uh, uh, white collar and tie uh, thing that people usually think of when they think of uh, service buses. Uh, I like to think of Rebus as a very, uh, very nice and relaxed bus that is very forgiving and it's uh, free and yeah, there's a lot of stuff that is kind of uh, hippie-like with it. So, uh, and it's not capitalistic in any way. Yeah, um, yeah. As I said, it's a messaging library and it sits there as a layer on top of MSMQ. Um, Rebus core is uh, one single uh, .NET 4 DLL, so you're guaranteed to be able to. Uh, include Rebus in your project and not have any conflicts with anything. And then uh, if you want integration with uh, different third-party stuff, then uh, that can be achieved with uh, small, uh, dedicated uh, integration projects. So for instance, uh, Rebus can actually use RabbitMQ as its uh, messaging transport uh, and can save stuff in uh, different kinds of databases and more stuff. Uh, my motivation for creating Rebus was that I've worked with uh, I've worked professionally with in service bus for a couple of years, um, but um, uh, after a couple of years, uh, Uli Dahan, the guy who created in service bus, he uh, changed the license so that you had to pay in order to use in service bus. 
Uh, and that made me really sad because I really like this. Uh, I like open source and uh, free software. Um, so, um, yeah. Moreover, in service was had some problems. Uh, it was uh, really hard to to get uh, started. Uh, to, I mean, it had some problems with uh, errors. It could would throw a null reference exception in the middle of uh, when you were invoking the configuration API and stuff like that. So, there was some stuff that uh, really annoyed me about in service bus. Uh, then I wanted to use Mass Transit, with it, which is an, uh, a, another free uh, service bus implementation on .NET, but uh, I actually could, I couldn't make it work. I had two days in a, a summer college at some point, and I, I just couldn't make it work. So maybe I checked out the code at some uh, unfortunate at some uh, unfortunate time or something, but uh, I just I gave up on uh, Mass Transit. Uh, then I wanted to fork in service bus from when it was was uh, still free. But uh, in Service Bus was like uh, 250 C sharp uh, projects and uh, 60,000 lines of code, and it was totally uh, at the time it, it was a complete mess. So um, actually, they have they have cleaned up a lot. Uh, I just want to say that. But at the time, the code base was really messy and uh, huge. Yeah. So I wanted to create Rebus, and uh, it has always been free, and it will continue to be. And moreover, uh, I want it to be really easy. And uh, a really uh, key uh, part of that is uh, it has to have really awesome error messages. So when you get an error message in uh, Rebus, it's not, uh, it's not a slap in the face. It's always uh, a step forward. So each uh, error message in Rebus will explain you exactly what is wrong uh, in pedagogical terms. And then it will, uh, it will suggest some kind of solution. So uh, for example, if you if you Rebus can uh, encrypt message bodies. So if you want to configure encryption and you forget to provide the key, then Rebus will generate a key for you and actually type out the XML that you can put into your configuration file. So it, I just want to make uh, stuff like that really easy so that it's easy to, to get going and easy to actually easy to get past uh, all of the Rebus stuff and just start working on your real code and solving your real problems. Yeah. Um, moreover, I just forgot to say, I, I started out, uh, wanted, I wanted to create Rebus in a way that you could uh, start out using it at the beginning of a project. And then at some point, if uh, the project became more serious and you could warrant the licen licensing uh, cost, you could uh, easily port all your code to a service bus. So therefore, all the APIs in Rebus are actually stolen from a service bus. So uh, all the APIs you're going to see, uh, except from the configuration API, all of the other APIs are stolen from in service bus. So, yeah. Right now, it's a fairly small project, 3,700 lines of C-sharp code. The code is on GitHub, and uh, it has uh, contributions from t 12 developers besides me. Uh, so I'm not the only one uh, developing it. Uh, and you uh, get up and running with Rebus by using NuGet. So that's basically the way you you get started uh, doing stuff in .NET uh, nowadays. The current version is called 0431. <laughs> it's a pretty uh, cryptic uh, version name, and uh, I have uh, often been asked when version 1.0 will be out, uh, but I don't think it makes that much sense. I mean, at some point, I wanted to create a version 1.0 uh, because this sounds kind of unofficial and sounds kind of alpha, but um, Rebus has been uh, moving money around since uh, version 014 alpha, and it, uh, it has controlled a couple of power plants since uh, 017 alpha. So, um, I mean, the version is just, that's just a number. It, it doesn't mean anything. So, there probably will never be a, a 1.0. Yeah. Um, I'm going to show you a, a Rebus demo in a, in a few seconds, but before we begin, there's just a few things that are good to know. Uh, with Rebus, all messages are plain old CLR objects. So when you want to create a new message type, you just create a class, uh, and then you put in some fields if you want some data along in your message, and then instances of that uh, class can be sent as messages. Um, in Rebus, all uh, endpoints have their own input queue. So the input queue of a Rebus endpoint is sort of the ID of the, of the endpoint. Um, and then each uh, message type is owned by one logical service. So that means that for each message type that is in, in, your, in all your systems, 
uh, you can always map that message type to one endpoint somewhere. And that endpoint will be the owner of that message. So, so this way there is a, a, an ownership uh, mapping, uh, you could say. Um, but I'm going to show you that in a, in a few seconds. Yeah. And then it's uh, already time for the first demo. Yeah. So let's hope that this works. I have a uh, simple solution here with uh, two projects, a client and a server. Both are, <coughs> are simple console applications that don't do anything at the moment. So now I want to uh, now I want to be able to send messages from the client to the server. So in order to do that, I will install Rebus into the server. And now in the server, I can configure. And then I provide this container adapter. In Rebus, uh, Rebus always wants some kind of container adapter, which is uh, usually the place where you will uh, use one of the flavors that exist for the IRC container that you're using, because it will use this container adapter to look up message handlers. So that's usually where you will bridge somehow to the IRC container of your choice. Then you go tr dot .transport. This uh, basically, the API always starts like this, and then you can dot, and then you can discover all the different configuration options available here. So this way, the API, the configuration I API is, uh, has this discovery thing going on. And then um, I configure the transport to use msmq and get input queue name from app config. That's a little long. And then I just create the bus and start it. So right now, I will have a bus running the program will exit immediately, so in order to avoid that, I will just go press enter to quit. Like this. I, s I, I told it to pick up the input queue name from appconfig, so I just have to provide a little bit of XML in appconfig to tell it which input queue to use. I do that with this reverse configuration section that I will just make a little more simple so you to reduce the noise. So basically what this one says is that this Rebus endpoint has an input queue called server.input. <coughs> then it has an error queue called error. This means that if the message processing from server.input fails more than five times in a row, then it will move the message to the error queue. So this way Rebus will never lose a message. It will never ever lose a message actually. It will uh, always make sure that the message, if something goes wrong, is uh, rolled back to the queue from where, from where it came. And then if it fails uh, too many times, it moves it to the error queue to avoid uh, denial of servicing your endpoint. Right. So now I should be able to start up the server. And, ooh. Okay, I got a couple of errors now because <laughs> actually it appears that there was some messages in the queue for this endpoint. It says that it couldn't find any handlers of type uh, for message of type system.string. So actually there, <laughs> there was a couple of strings in the input queue of this uh, endpoint. So just to prove that I'm not lying, I can uh, start out this uh, very simple MSM queue, uh, queue inspector. And then you can see now in the error queue, we have the three strings from from just now. So they're sitting here, safe, and they're not gone. All right. So um, let's create a message handler in here. This um, usually you would uh, you would uh, register uh, message handlers in your RSC container, but since I'm using this uh, built-in container adapter, which is uh, very simple, I will just uh, I can register handlers like this. I'll just go register some type, telling Rebus it can use this one as a handler. And then I make this one a message handler by going I handle messages of type string. This will, I'll, this will uh, force me to implement this uh, method called handle with the type that I specified here. And in this server, I would like to handle strings by just going got a greeting the message. So, I'll just start the server again. 
yes, and leave it running. So let's create the client. I will install the rebus package into the client. I will config oh configure the container adapter. I will tell it to use MSMQ in one-way client mode. This way the client will not have its own input queue, so it will be able to send messages to the server, but it will not be able to receive anything back. But that's okay. And this time I will call this message ownership thing, which will allow me to tell Rebus how it can determine who owns messages of a given type. And in this case, I will uh, tell it to pick it up from the Rebus configuration section. So I'll just uh, provide that message ownership information in a moment. And I will just read uh, a greeting in here. Type greeting like this, and then when I'm using the built-in container adapter, I can find the, the bus the bus instance that uh, that is the result of calling this API will be on the bus property. So I can just get it like this. Usually, w if you're using an IOC container, you would resolve the iBus from your container. And I will just send this greeting. So notice how in uh, on the client here, I don't I don't worry about who is going to receive this message. I just uh, tell Rebus that I want to send this message. And then Rebus will have to figure out where to send it. So that's sort of where the sort of the this very, very simple bus layer kicks in and uh, uses these uh, very simple ownership uh, mappings uh, to determine where the message should go. So in this case, I will provide uh, an, a Rebus configuration section here remove all the input queue stuff, and then I will use one single endpoint mapping, which is the way you map a message type to an endpoint, to the owning endpoint. In this case, I want to map system.string from mscallib to server.input. So as you can see, this is a very, very simple way of specifying that uh, messages of type system string are owned by the endpoint hiding behind server.input. So now I should be able to start the client. And the client is running and the server is running. And now I can type hi. And I got the greeting. So as you can see, I can now send messages from the client to the server. And to prove that no messages were lost, I have these three strings in my error queue. I can uh, <laughs> I can select these messages and then uh, since Rebus puts the original the source queue which is the queue where these messages failed as a, an extra message header, Rebus can return these messages to the source queue and this way deliver the messages to the server. And yeah, this way no messages were lost. Yeah, so that was a very short demo uh, showing how how simple it is to get up and running with uh, with Rebus. So now back to the to the three problems that I talked about. Uh, we talked about this uh, system that was uh, becoming too big and integration with external parties and some complex logic with coordination and timing. The first problem, uh, and I have uh, sort of uh, stolen the setting from uh, from the work at uh, one of our uh, clients at the T60. Uh, where we're building this uh, trading platform. Um, yeah. So uh, imagine that we're building a trading platform where traders in front office are uh, st striking deals with their counterparties, and then um, some administrative personnel in the back office uh, will make sure that these counterparties are charged. So we, we, have, we have an application that can capture trades and can do invoicing. So already it feels like we have a system that is sort of doing too much and it's not really focused. So um, I want to pull in a few uh, few of the things that have been mentioned today. Um, but I'm going to add distributed to this one uh, because there is a kind of uh, a kind of domain driven design that has this extra D in front, which is uh, distributed domain driven design, which uh, 
later I think evolved into all this uh, CQRS and event sourcing uh, stuff that is going on in .NET at the moment. Um, but the, the key thing is that um, we use this uh, concept of a bounding, bounded context from domain-driven design to uh, to uh, sort of capture the fact that we may have uh, different subdomains in our big domain. So in this case, we have this uh, big commodity trading domain, uh, but actually there there are two subdomains at play here. We have this uh, trading domain where the traders are uh, punching trades into the system, and we have a billing domain where some people, uh, usually once a month or something like that, will go and select a lot of trades, and then they will make sure that the counterparties are uh, are invoiced. Yeah. So uh, in this case, in the first demo, I will show how Rebus can uh, perhaps y help you uh, separate your big system into uh, two separate domains. So let's just stop these again. And let's demo one. In this demo, I have two two solution folders called back office and front office. In uh, front office, I have the trading service here, which is a simple Rebus endpoint that will it will configure a subscription storage. This means that this endpoint will be able to store subscribers, it will be able to publish messages to those subscribers. So, uh, so this way Rebus can has this implementation of, uh, of uh, publish subscribe uh, that you can use. And in this uh, trading endpoint, I will uh, input the name of a counterparty and an amount and a price, and then it will publish this new trade recorded event. New trade recorded is just a simple class uh, that I have made in this trading.messages assembly. So this way in billing, this way billing can include a reference to the trading.messages assembly and have access to this uh, type of event. And billing, which is also a simple reverse endpoint, can subscribe to the new trade recorded event. So when it starts up, it establishes a subscription uh, to this event. Since the uh, publisher has is uh, using a MongoDB as a subscription storage, it will uh, remember this forever. So even if I restart the, the publisher or kill it or whatever I can think of, it will uh, it will know that this uh, subscriber exists when it starts up again. Yes, and then the subscriber registers this handler called <laughs> charge the customer, which just which handles this new trade record event and just prints out the message, the information on the console. So let's try and run this one. That was billing. And that was trading. So now when I'm trading, I can do this and it will get the published events. So this way you can, you can use uh, publish subscribe messaging between your applications and they will Oh, sorry. <laughs> there was an error. Apparently, a string is not a valid number. I'm sorry. Let's just start this one out again. I wanted to stop billing. Uh, I want to kill billing and then publish some events. And as you can see, when billing starts up again, it will uh, receive these events as if uh, nothing happened. So this way we can have uh, reliable messaging and these systems will be very loosely coupled and will not care whether they're both there at the same time. So that's pretty neat. Then our second problem is uh, integration with an external party. Uh, in our trading domain here we have, uh, we have this uh, new department called middle office that need to confirm all trades when they're made and they confirm these trades by asking an external SOAP web service called credit assessment and asking it whether this uh, client is, uh, is good or not. So it's a very simple uh, credit assessment service. Um, here we want it to be asynchronous so that we don't, uh, we don't wait for the result, basically. So we, if the SOAP web service is slow or if it's uh, down, uh, the rest of the system will just continue. 
Moreover, it has to be reliable. So uh, we we will never forget what we were doing. So if this uh, soap web service is uh, is not available, then it's it's really important that it will that this um, call will still go through when it becomes available. Uh, and in order to do that, we will uh, use Rebus's automatic retries. Uh, and I've just made this uh, very simple uh, uh, sequence diagram to show you what's going to happen now. Trading will publish this uh, new trade recorded event, which will be now it will be subscribed to from confirmations. Confirmations will send a get credit status request to an integration service. This integration service is just a very, very simple Rebus endpoint whose uh, sole responsibility in the world is to receive these get credit status requests, then make this external SOAP call, which is the unsafe operation, and then it will return the, a reply containing the result of this call. And then when that happens, when that reply is received in confirmations, it will publish this trade confirmed or a trade rejected event, depending on the outcome. Yeah. So let's see how we can make a web service call by using a messaging facade. Let's demo two. <coughs> so now I have the same code as before. Nothing has changed except I've added this middle office thing. Middle office has the confirmations service, which was this one. And then it has uh, a, a couple of messages, a couple of events that it can publish. And then it has this external folder containing the integration service, which is uh, this one. And, and then I've put this credit assessment, uh, very unsafe uh, SOAP web service in here, which is, uh, has a very devious implementation. As you can see, it actually fails 75% of the times that you call it. Uh, and then 25% of the times it will use the, the length of the counterpart name to determine whether he's good or not. So it's a pretty crazy implementation, actually. But uh, the point is that it fails almost every time you call it. Yeah. In this integration service, I have made this very simple handler that handles the get credit status request. That was this one. And then it makes the call and returns the reply back to whoever sent this one. And it can do this by creating the client, making the SOAP web service call, and then using the bus to reply. So this way, the bus will just reply back to whoever sent the message that we're currently handling. Yeah. Last thing to show is in confirmations, we have the thing that invokes all of this. It's the check credit status handler. This uh, confirmation service has uh, subscribed to the new trade recorded event, and then it uh, has this handler that handles the reply. When handling the new trade recorded, it will just use the bus to send this one, and then the bus has an endpoint mapping that maps this get credit status request to the integration service, and then since we are the sender of this uh, request, we will get the reply, and then depending on the status, we will publish a trade confirmed or trade rejected event. So let's just try and run this. So as you can see, you oh, there was a call waiting in a queue. So now the debug debugger just broke into the debugger here. But yeah, nothing really happened, actually. It's, it's still running back here. Um, let's just see if billing is hiding back here. So now we have trading up here. We have the new confirmation service, sorry. <laughs> we have the confirmation service here, and we have the integration service here. So all the, all the gray and yellow logging is, uh, is okay. Yellow is warning. So this one actually hasn't experienced any errors. So even though it got an exception, because of uh, the automatic retry mechanism, it would, would retry up to five times. It would just log this error as a warning. And then it looks like, since there's no red logging in here, the, the call would eventually go through. So let's see if we can make this fail. Oh, I could make this one fail. Yeah. No, actually, I, I don't want to spend time uh, making this one fail. I will rather see if I can make the last demo fail, because it's more important there. But important point is that the calls go through, even though it has uh, 
some availability, pretty obvious availability problems uh, over here. Yeah. So the third pro problem was this uh, complex coordination and timing thing. So imagine now that the uh, billing needs to charge the customer, uh, but, uh, but this process can be optimized by uh, sending out one big invoice if the credit status of the client is good. Uh, uh, but, but if the credit status is bad, then we want to uh, send the invoice immediately to, to avoid uh, uh, any risks. Uh, yeah. So this way, uh, billing will now uh, once this new trade recorded event is received, it will await the credit status, and then depending on this credit status, it will send the invoice uh, in one way or another. So, so we have this uh, process going on now. To avoid uh, forgetting to send these invoices, in case uh, this uh, web service call fails and never returns any reply, we want uh, to take uh, an some kind of alternative action if nothing has happened uh, within 10 seconds. Um, this is actually what is called a process manager in the literature, uh, which is a uh, stateful service, uh, which is sort of a state machine inside a service whose transitions are triggered by messages. So just imagine this state machine where all transitions are triggered by messages. That's a process manager. And we can have uh, any number of instances of this, uh, of this state machine. Then we want to introduce uh, some kind of a timeout concept to allow us to take alternative action if, uh, if this process hasn't completed within uh, 10 seconds. Uh, and we want to be able to perform these compensating actions, which in this case is uh, very simple. We just want to send an email if nothing has happened. So now the sequence diagram looks like this. Uh, trading will publish the new trade recorded event, which will go to both confirmations and billing. In confirmations, we have all this SOAP thing going on. I just hit all the integration service stuff uh, in this uh, small loop, make external call. So it has some, some kind of l local thing going on, but we don't have to care about that. When this confirmations uh, thing is over, it will publish the trade confirmed event, event, which will end the process in billing, and then billing can do its invoicing uh, the way that it wants to. But in order to if, uh, if this trade confirmed event never arrives, then this process will sort of continue to live on. Uh, and then at some point, we want to wake up this process. So therefore, in billing, when we start the process, we will send a timeout request to a timeout service, whose uh, only responsibility in life is to receive a timeout request, wait the time that, uh, that is specified in this timeout request, and then it will return a timeout reply after that time. So this way, we can order a timeout request a sort of a wake-up call after 10 seconds. So billing will use that to wake up itself after 10 seconds if uh, the process hasn't completed. Yes, so that will be demo three. So now I have changed, I have changed billing. And um, I apologize in advance because this code may look a little bit crazy when you look at it at first, but it, it, it is actually really simple. <laughs> uh, trust me. <laughs> now, the, the message handler in billing, called charge the customer, is now what in service bus likes to call a saga, but that's actually just, that's what's called a process manager in the literature about distributed systems. So. Uh, why he chose to call it Saga, I don't know. That's a, a thing he, he stole from the database theory, I think. This uh, process processes state um, is made out of this billing Saga data class. So I'm, I, I've created this class that can uh, model the state of my state machine while this process is going on. In my, in my state machine, I want to store the trade ID and the counterpart uh, name. And then I want to store the, uh, the trade details and the result of the credit assessment. So, and these are nullable because I don't want to make any assumptions on the order in which these pieces of information arrive. So when I get the trade details, I will remember those. And when I get the credit assessment result, I will remember that. And then I have this uh, way of checking whether I have received these uh, statuses and trade details and I can use that uh, to complete the process. Now this uh, saga 
is uh, it's triggered by incoming messages, so I have to uh, uh, I have to uh, handle all the different kinds of messages that can trigger transitions in my state machine. In this case, I use this uh, special um, I am initiated by interface, which is actually just a derivation of I handle messages that adds some uh, extra semantic um, because uh, because it allows uh, it allows Rebus to create a new saga if an existing one cannot be found for this incoming message. So this way, my saga process here can actually be initiated both by this event, but it can also be initiated by the trade confirmed and trade rejected events. Uh, and I'm doing that because if this new trade recorded event somehow uh, fails while being handled in billing, it will be moved to the error queue, and then the chances are that I will receive the trade confirmed before I receive the new trade recorded or uh, can process the new trade recorded successfully in billing. So this way I can make my system robust uh, towards uh, the order of uh, the messages. Yeah. Um, in here, in the saga, I have to specify which fields should be correlated. So for each incoming message, I can point out a field in the message and tell it that it should correlate that with a field in the saga data. So this saga instance, if there, if an incoming new trade record event, if there exists a saga instance with a trade ID that matches the trade ID of the incoming message, then that instance will be loaded and will be made available to me. Otherwise, since I use this I am initiated by, it will create a new instance of the saga for these events. Yeah. I'm just going to run over this, co this code really quickly. Uh, the, the code will be available afterwards on GitHub, so you can uh, check it out uh, later on if, you, if you're curious. Uh, since I handle these uh, new trade recorded and uh, trade confirmed and trade rejected events uh, uh, in the same way, I have to possibly schedule verification in all of them. So that's the way I, I handle all of these. In this method, I can ask whether this saga is new if it's new, then I can use this defer API in Rebus to send a message into the future. <laughs> so I can send this verify complete message 10 seconds into the future. So underneath the covers, this will it will serialize this one into a timeout request, send it to the timeout manager, which will wait for 10 seconds, and then it will return it in a timeout reply. And then Rebus will unpack this verify complete message, and it will attempt to dispatch it to the saga uh, the way that I've specified here. So this way, if the saga has not been completed when this message arrives, then we can write out uh, some information to the console or send an email or whatever we want to. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to try and, and run this one, and then we'll see if it uh, if it works. So now I actually want to make this one fail because uh, then you can see the the timeout being triggered. So I have the confirmation and the integration service, and then. Let's do some trading. And it's taking the credit status and it's completed. Let's try again. And now it failed, so the message is moved to the error queue. So the process has stopped. And then within 10 seconds, the process should be woken up by the timeout reply. And then we can do whatever we want, send an email or warn an admi administrator or whatever it makes sense to do. So this way we can make sure that these, even though uh, messages might fail and might end up in error queues uh, along the way and, and these processes might uh, halt, then we can resume the process and take alternative action. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. You can check out the code if it, uh, if it looked weird. <laughs> yes. So to sum it up, I think that uh, messaging provides a model that uh, that they really can help you glue the pieces together when uh, you break down this uh, system into bounded contexts, which is appears to be a recurring theme that has been discussed all day on the architecture's track. Moreover, it can uh, help you overcome uh, glitches when you uh, when you're integrating with stuff that is uh, not as available as you are, and you can avoid uh, other parties' availability problems being imposed on you. So that's pretty nice. And moreover, it can be used to make uh, these, these kind of processes that 
occur in these messaging-based systems, make them uh, explicit, and uh, create a model that uh, models one specific process in a very uh, tight and uh, explicit way, uh, which I, I think is uh, really neat. So I hope you agree with me. Yeah, and now I'm going to finish it this off uh, really quickly. Um, as I mentioned, Rebus uh, is not really tied to MSMQ as such. It can do MSMQ uh, out of the box, but uh, it also uh, happily uses uh, RabbitMQ and Azure Service Bus as a transport layer. Uh, they both support the same transactional guarantees, so that if a message fails, it can be rolled back to the source queue and stuff like that. And when you send many messages, they will either be sent, all of them, atomically or not. So it has the same transactional properties when you're using RabbitMQ and Azure Service Bus as well. And it can use a SQL Server as a transport. So if all you have in the world is, uh, is a SQL Server, then you can still do this uh, messaging thing. Uh, then it can store subscriptions and sagas in SQL Server and RavenDB and MongoDB. Uh, using a document database to store a saga is a, re a really obvious choice because the saga is just a document. Then it can use these IOC containers to activate handlers and use different kind of logging frameworks. It can send messages in batches, so you can optimize certain stuff, uh, avoid the overhead. Uh, so even though you have small messages in your code, you can avoid the overhead of sending many small messages. Then it can, ex it can do handler pipeline reordering. So if you have multiple handlers that handle the same message, um, you can tell Rebus to invoke one specific handler first. So you can use that to, for example, uh, do some kind of authorization uh, of incoming messages. Um, and then you can do polymorphic dispatch, which is uh, <laughs> a way that you can, for example, make an I handle messages of object, and then it will receive all messages. So you can use inheritance and interfaces on messages, uh, and then use those interfaces uh, in your handlers. Then it can encrypt message bodies, this is not the uh, NSA grade encryption. This is more meant for, I mean, if you want to send messages around in organization with payroll information or s some kind of f a little bit sensitive uh, information, then uh, you can just tell Rebus to encrypt the message body uh, and then it will not be immediately visible uh, in your queues uh, what is in the message. And it can compress message bodies, so you can send pretty big messages. Um, yeah, maybe I will call Rebus uh, 1.0 at some point, I don't know. Uh, one of the contributors, uh, Eska, uh, is uh, right now working on having this uh, central monitoring service for Rebus that you can uh, start up somewhere and then build into the central monitoring thing. There is a web endpoint that will show you all the Rebus endpoints that you are currently running. And uh, all the Rebus endpoints will uh, periodically send a heartbeat to this uh, central service so you can get a really good overview of uh, what is running. So when you have, uh, if you have lots of endpoints, then that's uh, pretty neat. Then um, Rebus actually already has a H an HTTP gateway, which is uh, provides a way to uh, send messages uh, from one location to another over the internet, for example. So you can fairly easily proxy this one with an HTTPS uh, proxy or something like that, so you can uh, make sure that the messages are securely uh, transferred. Uh, but this allows Rebus to uh, cross uh, boundaries where MSMQ, for example, would not work. Um, then it could be interesting to add some additional transports, but uh, right now it seems like no one has really asked for, for more than MSMQ and RabbitMQ and Azure Service Bus. So maybe there will be additional transports in the future. And then since MSMQ doesn't do uh, competing consumers uh, well, it would make sense perhaps to create some kind of distributor process that will uh, load balance your MSMQ reverse endpoints. Uh, but uh, Azure Service Bus and uh, RabbitMQ don't need that. So if you want to scale your uh, message processing, you can just use RabbitMQ and have multiple, uh, multiple endpoints taken out of one queue. If I've uh, said something that uh, sounded uh, that sounded cool, it probably came from uh, one of these books, which I really encourage you to read if you haven't done it already. Uh, and then uh, I also, yeah, you could also uh, read uh, what uh, Udi Dahan and Greg Young, uh, and Dan North, and some other people are writing. Uh, they're doing some really cool stuff uh, with uh, these things. Udi Dahan is the guy who created this in Service Bus project. Uh, whose ideas I stole. So, 
yeah. And uh, yeah. Thank you for listening. <laughs>